Hello, my name is Mike Holman. I'm the deaf pastor here at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Lebanon, Indiana. I wanna welcome you to our Deaf Sunday School class. Nobody is here again. And it's because of the coronavirus that has been spreading and people have been sick and so people are staying home, schools are closed, churches closed. This is our third Sunday. So I'm very excited to get it back to normal soon. I don't know when that's gonna be, but it appears that things are becoming better. So we are going to go live once again. Things have been messed up and we've been frustrated, but God is challenging us to face our problems. You know that? God wants to see if we're going to get angry, if we're going to praise him, or if we're going to be paranoid and afraid. He wants to see what our attitude is going to be with all the problems. There's been no school. The kids have been frustrated. And all we hear is, Mom and Dad, I'm bored. And it, I know it gets to feeling a little bit overwhelmed. I feel you, I'm the same way, I feel that same way with the problems that we're having to face and they seem like they're all around us. But I've been reading the Bible and there's one great story and that story is in the book of Exodus. And this is the man's name, Moses. Moses, this is his sign name. Maybe head long, wavy hair, crazy hair, or shaggy eyebrows. I don't know why, but this is his name, Moses. And I love Moses. And you can find um, the story takes place in Egypt. He was born as a baby, and his mother was worried and didn't want him to be found and killed because he was a baby boy, and that was the decree from Pharaoh, the king of the land. He was angry. He wasn't happy. Uh, he didn't like the Jewish people because they were they were growing and 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 he, so he said that he was going to start killing all the baby boys. So Moses' mom hid him in a basket, put him in the in a river, and Pharaoh's daughter found him and brought him home to be her own son. And he grew up there in the palace. And then he made the decision that he didn't want to be an Egyptian. He wanted to go back with his Jewish people. So from there, we are going to uh, focus on him. So I want to add uh, that through all of the problems um, that we're having through the coronavirus and everything that's happening, God is showing his power. Uh, and we need to look to him, same as Moses did. So we'll go ahead and begin. And I want to review just a little bit about all the plagues that were there. I'm not going to go into depth. But first we had the water in the river turning to blood. Uh, uh, one of the reasons was because they were worshiping the river for food and, and for business and stuff. And so God challenged Moses uh, with his rod to touch the river and it became red as blood. There's kind of a picture behind this plague and the meaning of it. Blood, why blood? Blood is used, was used to wash away our sins. Jesus paid our sin debt with his blood. And over and over and over again, we see that he emphasizes the blood. It's the blood that saves us. Whose blood? Jesus's blood, because only his blood was perfect. He is God. He had the only perfect, clean blood, and we must depend on him. And I, and I want to kind of give you pictures through the plagues. Um, and I, and I want to give you some reveals and, and, and some more uh, signs from the Old Testament that kind of point to the New Testament, things that happened in the Old Testament that we didn't understand, but now with all that we're seeing happening today and pastors that are studying and they're teaching and uh, we're trying to improve our understanding and know the Bible more and more and you look on the computer and you're finding all the, all the different truths and you're putting it all together and helping you to understand so I'm going to show you why blood. The lamb, that was Jesus. Okay, we have the lamb, we have Jesus. We're going to compare. Now, Easter is today. Today is Sunday. It's Easter. 
you know, many people would celebrate with eggs and the bunny rabbit and uh, a good food and they celebrate with family and that's all fine and good, that's okay. But the real reason about Easter we wanna teach you is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died and he rose again, not ascending to heaven yet, talking about his death and he rose again to live again. We were all born in sin and we must be born again, have Jesus inside of us, the resurrection inside of us. So the blood, I wanna give you an example to help you understand better. You know, chocolate milk, how many of you like chocolate milk? Chocolate milk, what does this have to do with anything? I like to drink chocolate milk. See the white milk there? And then they're pouring chocolate into that milk and it's going to become brown. Chocolate milk and then you stir it up and you drink it and it's delicious. That's a picture of Jesus' blood. We have sin in our lives. This is just a picture, mind you, and his blood washes our hearts as white as snow. Now I have a question for you. Once you put that chocolate into that milk, can you separate it out again? Take all that chocolate out of the milk and make it white milk again? You cannot do that, you're stuck. It's, it's forever chocolate milk. That's the same thing that Jesus' blood did with, your, with, you, with you. When he came into your heart, he can never leave. He's with you forever. You are his child, you're a child of God. The blood was important, not our good works, not our deeds. Oh, look at me, God, look at all the things I'm doing. I'm getting on Facebook, I'm doing a live stream, I'm doing good things, I'm clean, I'm holy, you know. No, no, it's the blood. It's the blood of Jesus that can save you, only the blood of Jesus. That excites me so much. I hope you're excited. I am so excited this morning. God is good. Now, there's 10 plagues, so we're gonna kind of go through each one of them just real quick. I wanna share with you, as I'm looking around and at the amazing signs and the mighty works of God, the coronavirus is going on, things that are happening, it's so amazing. People who are studying God and, and they're starting to pay attention, I wanna share something with you. I went to the store to Kroger and I walked in and there's people everywhere with masks on and there's other people who are the workers who are cleaning and they're also paranoid and and then they have the X's on the floor where you have to stay six feet apart I and mean, said so that is so strange and you know social distancing and how many feet six feet six why six feet I got to thinking about it you know, God put these things together, you know, God's in charge. He knew all this was going to happen. He put it all together. Six, the number six, the Bible word, the number six, that's the number of sin, the fall of sin. The number seven, that's the number of perfection. But I want to talk about the number of six. That's fall, the fall into sin. Adam fell into sin. And then the number six, six, six. We get scared of that number. I'm not afraid of that number, 666. That's the mark of the beast. It's very dumb. You'll get it on your hand, you'll get it on your forehead. Stupid. It's for people who have rejected God. You know when you're, uh, when the people that um, are playing the lottery and they, they pull that one-armed bandit and they get 777, and then they win the jackpot, well, 777 for you, that's the perfect number. That's God's number. 666, that's the number of the devil. That's the rejection of God. That's, that's failure, that's sin, that's stupid. You rejected God, and I want to warn you, you need to accept Christ, you need to accept him so that you can go to heaven, amen? Now, there's 10 plagues. That number 10, that's the number of order. 10 commandments that we're supposed to obey. Uh, just like the governor's order, you can have no more than 10 in a group. Uh, 
and in a certain place and you've got those those X's on the floor in a straight line six feet apart that reminds me of judgment day where we're all going to be lined up and those who have rejected Christ who have not asked him to come into their heart will go to hell one day and all these things just cross my mind and I'm thinking God wow you're giving us a warning just like Noah in the days of Noah where he preached and he preached and here us pastors are, we're preaching and we're warning and people aren't paying attention or they're ignoring it. Ten plagues, that number ten. These are warnings, warning signs in the Jewish people. They were seeing this. So here we have ten signs. The last one was the death of all firstborns. Even Pharaoh in Egypt, his son passed away. And I want to talk about today uh, the Passover, resurrection. That's what today is about, uh, where the Jews had to put the, the blood on the doorpost. So the first sign was the blood. The water turned to blood. And then you have all these, but the very last sign was the death of the firstborn. It's a warning. I want to expand this a little bit more, go a little bit deeper. Here we see the Passover. God told the Jewish people that they were to take the blood of a lamb. They were to take a, a perfect lamb and they were to kill it and they were to take the blood. See here, we're seeing the blood again and they were to put it on the doorposts, on the sides and on the top of the door. And the, the blood, of course, would probably drip down. I have a picture here. They're putting the blood on the doorpost. This is a picture. There's the lamb. You see the lamb here. The lamb had to be a perfect lamb without blemish, and they had to kill this lamb. Can you imagine the children, how sorrowful? Oh, my pet lamb, and they'd be crying, and, and the poor little lamb, and then he's killed, and the blood is shed. That's the same Jesus. He was innocent. He died on the cross. There were some that cherished him, and they didn't want him to die, but he took that punishment. Why did he do that? He did that to replace, to take our place, so that we would not have to go to hell. Jesus wanted to be our substitute, your substitute for your sin. He took that sin upon himself on the cross that day. All that disgusting sin. And he suffered through it and agonized through it. We were watching a movie this week about Jesus being beaten. And, and, and it wasn't like they depicted it. was like they depicted it, but it was so much worse. They, they plucked out his beard and they beat him. And, and, and people were watching it. It was so disgusting. They couldn't bear to look at it. They couldn't bear to see his face. I mean, they beat him so badly you couldn't even recognize him. And Jesus did that because he loved you and he loved those people. And Jesus said, you must believe. Confess your sins. Confess that you're a sinner that you were born into sin, and then you must be born again. Well, how do I do that? Believe on the name of Jesus Christ, accept him into your heart, accept that blood to wash away your sins so that your name will be recorded in the book of life in heaven someday. And guess what? God's pencil does not have an eraser. He does not. When your name goes into the book of life, it's there forever. You know, some people lose, uh, that uh, teach that you can lose your salvation. That is completely wrong. God does not change his mind. He made that promise. He loves you. When you decide to accept him and serve him forever, he's yours. Maybe you accept him and then you change your mind. You serve. You, don't, you decide, I don't want to serve him anymore. And, but you're still going to be saved. Me? I, I want to change my life. I want to give back to him. I want to thank him for what he did, for dying on the cross. I want to tell everybody about it, how he paid for my sin. And what you have to do, you have to admit that you're not perfect. You are a sinner and ask him to save you. I'm excited. I'm running out of breath here. So back to the Passover, you see the death angel. When the death angel came that night, if the death angel did not see the blood... Then the firstborn had died. Now, look, you'll see the blood here on the top and on the posts. The top, 
It's kind of a picture of Jesus, the top post. That's where the crown of thorns were and the sides where Jesus' hands were on the cross. This is kind of a sign of a cross. Um, kind of like the Star of David. It's like, it's like two pictures of the Trinity. Uh, like two pictures of the Trinity. You see the, you see the top, the head, and, the, and the, the, each side are like where his, where his hands were nailed in and the bottom where his feet were nailed. It's, it's a study, a study and read up on it. Anyway, back to this. The angel, he came that night and if he saw a doorpost with the blood on the post, he would cross, he would pass that doorway because they, they had obeyed. But if they had ignored, if they had gotten too busy, if they had not done what they were told to do by putting the blood on the doorpost, then their firstborn died. This is a warning, mom and dads. You know, you don't care about church or you don't bring your children to church. So children are watching mom and dad. And they can ultimately pay the price and die and go to hell because we didn't do what we were supposed to do by going to church and leading them the way to the Lord and, and bringing them to where they could learn about Jesus. Children, the children, they can accept Christ at a young age as soon as they get to understand. It's not being sprinkled by a priest and saying, okay, you're saved. No, that's not how it is. It's our responsibility at home to bring our children to a place where they can also accept Christ as their savior. Sending them to a Sunday school class where they can hear about Jesus and how to go to heaven. And, and they'll come home. Maybe they'll come home and say, you know, Mom and Dad, I'm not saved. And then you can help them to ask Jesus to come in their heart and they can be saved too. And their name will also be written in the book of life. Guess what? Egypt, none of them had the blood on their doorposts. They didn't care. Uh, maybe I'm sure that Moses had warned them to also put the blood on their doorposts, and I'm sure they laughed. And as the death angel came through that night, even to the firstborn son of the king Pharaoh, the firstborn, they died because they did not have the blood. And that was the Passover. I want to discuss about this man named Moses. He was a man of God. And a picture of Moses is also like you and like me. When I was reading about him, I was thinking, wow, Moses, he was a leader and, and, and he, had, he had people to follow him. Kind of the same as me. I have my children follow me as I go to church and, I, and I'm leading them. God loved Moses. God loved me. God loves you. He parted the waters. Here in this picture, you see it. It's also a picture of salvation. The Red Sea crossing, what happened was finally they got to a place where Pharaoh let the people go. And probably a million people and, and they all that went walking out of Egypt. But they came to this Red Sea and it was just so much water. And what are we going to do? The Egyptians are behind us. They had decided to follow the people and, and bring them back. And, and the, the river was in front of them. And Lord, what are we going to do? And they're crying. And Moses, what are we going to do? The river's in front of us. The, the Egyptians are behind us. And so Moses, he, he, lifts, he lifts his rod. Our rod is the Bible. He lifts his rod. He stretches it out. And the sea, by faith, the Red Sea parts, and all the people were able, all the Jewish people, by faith, were able to cross the Red Sea on dry land. Because the promised land was on the other side. The Egyptians, that's a picture of the world. God wants you to leave the world. He wants you to go to the promised land. But you can only cross by faith, by trusting Jesus. Same idea here. The people had to trust Moses, who, tr who ultimately trusted the Lord. But for their survival, they had to cross by faith. And many of the people later, they complained, and, and uh, Moses had to keep reminding them to trust God. And many people died on the way, and they missed getting to go to the blessing. The younger generations, they got to ultimately go there. 
God wants you to have faith to go all the way till the day you die. You're gonna face problems, the coronavirus, it doesn't matter what comes along. Have faith, trust God. I have problems at home sometimes. I wanna rip my hair out. I, I fuss my children, fuss my wife, I'm just kidding. But the other day, this past week, we had a lightning strike in our at our home. And uh, many things that blew up, and one of the things that blew up was a thermostat. And uh, so I tried to change it, but then when I unplugged the ACE air conditioner, it continued uh, running, and, and the furnace was not running, and everything was broken, and I couldn't figure it out. The lightning had just blown all this equipment at our house out. And I was like, what in the world? What's going on? And, and it was, it was going to be very, very cold that night. And I asked my wife, well, what are we going to do? So that night we, we were very cold. And, but I went to the store and I bought a new thermostat because I was going to replace it myself. And I really didn't know how to, but I took the old one off and I put the new one on. But I did not read the instructions. Oh, I know how to do this. I can do this all by myself. And you know, the different, there's different, like six or seven different wires. There's two red ones and I'm staying, sitting here and I'm looking at all these wires. And I, well, I remember my old job, you know, you just hook these two wires in together. And, but this is a little bit different, but it had like what's called a metal bridge inside this thermostat. And I'm like, am I supposed to take that on off or am I supposed to leave it on? I think I'll just leave it on. So I hook in the wires and my son said, oh, it's working. So we run out to the furnace and the boiler and it's going and I'm so happy and oh, we're gonna be so warm in our house tonight. Went to sleep all night long and I woke up and it was freezing cold in our house. What happened? And I went and oh no. That little metal piece that I decided to leave in the thermostat, I was supposed to remove it because the wires were not supposed to touch because we had a furnace and an air conditioner on the same thermostat. And what happened was those two touched and it burned the transformer in the furnace and the motherboard on the air conditioner. So we called the air conditioner guy and he came, he was able to fix it, but I had to pay $150 the other day for the furnace and I had to take that out of my wallet. I had to pay $150, I had to pay the price because I made a stupid decision. I didn't read the instructions and my wife's just looking at me and I said, I made a mistake, but I didn't get angry, she didn't get angry. I felt disgusted with myself. The man came and he said, well, you've learned your lesson, I guess. I said, ugh. It should have only cost me $20, but instead it costed me $150 because I didn't read the instructions. What was I supposed to have done? I should have read the instructions. It was simple. It was right there for me and I neglected to read those instructions. And that's the same thing. The Bible is our instructions and when we don't read them, we mess up our life. And Moses, he tried to remind these people to, to look at God and they wouldn't do it and they had all kinds of problems. and. The bottom line is we need to obey God. We need to trust God. We need to read our Bible. We need to pray. We need to stay together with our families. I'm so excited to be at home with my wife and my children and we spend time together and I'm excited. You know, the, it doesn't matter what the governor ordered. I wanna honor what God is telling us to do. And you know, some people are still going out to restaurants and, and, and all these other things that we used to do and they're not focusing on their families and God's saying, hey, wait a minute, let's stop all this. It's time to be home with your family. And I cherish this time. I thank God for the coronavirus. Thank you, I love you, because this is time that we can cherish and be with our families. And uh, when it's done, we're all gonna get back together as a church, but we have taken the focus off of God where it should be. That's the problem. God's giving us a second chance. He's forgiving us and he wants us to begin to trust him again. This is a gorgeous picture. I love looking at this picture. All these people, as they're walking across the land, they're going into their new life. Egypt, the old, the world, some of them cried because they left, but they're going into a new life. You know, when I got saved, I left my old life. I went into a new life. It was exciting. And now I have to wear ties, and, but I carry my Bible, and, you know, people think that I'm weird, you know, but 
you know, I have to be baptized after I was saved. And, and you know, baptism, that's just a symbol that, that you're saved and you're ready to go on with your new life. You have a new identity in Jesus Christ. You're not afraid to tell the world about the cross. You know, the people at the cross, they spit on Jesus and they were ashamed of him. But you know what? He, he was persecuted. Nobody is spitting on you. Nobody is beating you. What we go through is so simple, comparable to what he went through. You know, but people won't tell the good news because they're scared. Okay, so we dress up, we go to church, we read our Bible, or some people, they decide to stay at home and they get on their vlogs and they, and they, they get on Facebook Live or whatever, but they're lazy. Get up on Sunday morning when this is all over, go to church. Well, Sunday night, I'm so tired. I don't want to go Wednesday. I got to go to church again. I got to go pass out tracts. I'm tired. I'm tired. Don't you think Jesus was tired when he suffered on that cross and he bled and died for you? Don't be a crybaby. What we go through is not comparable to what he went through. We are so comfortable. And, you know, the deaf people, we get on there and we tell everybody what we think they should know. Now, back to Moses. I'm going to kind of tie all this in together. Moses, he is a man of God. He served God. He loved God. God loved him. Same as you. God loves you. You know, Moses made mistakes. He had a temper problem. He murdered somebody. You know, he got mad and hit the rock instead of speaking to it like God told him to. He made some mistakes. You know, when he hit that rock instead of speaking to it, he sinned. He disobeyed God. If you think, oh, well, I'm sinned, so God's going to send me straight to hell even after I'm saved, you're wrong again. You know, if you continue to sin, you ignore God, but you are a child of his, God may just take you home. If you want to do your own way, then you may be done. You need to be careful. God wants your prayer life. God is interested in your prayer life more than you go into church or, 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 or visiting people. God wants one-on-one -on -one time with you. That's all. You know, let me pray. Let people see me pray. See how holy I am. No, God's not interested in that. God wants your private prayer time. I love my prayer time. I always hide in my bed. I put the covers over my head and I pray and I pray and I pray and I talk and I commune with God and I ask him to help me and I know that I make mistakes and I want to be strong and I want to get be right with you and I want to cling to you. I want to cling to you. Hey God, help me. I need you. I, I, I want you and I pray and I pray and he does. He helps me. That's all. And I want to give you three keys of a successful prayer life. Three keys to a successful prayer life. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. Continue praying. And that's what God said. Pray without ceasing. You can find that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. That's a key verse to this lesson. Pray, pray, pray. Get off your phone. Get off your video phone. Have a prayer life. Are you having a prayer life with your friends? God's jealous. God's jealous. He wants his time with you. You need your God phone, GP. Your time with God. You know, there's a video app called Marco Polo. You can get on and, and talk. and I mean, it's not live. You can video yourself and then... Uh, send it. There's nobody there, so you're kind of talking to yourself. So why don't you turn it instead of your MP, Marco Polo, turn it to your GP, your God phone. Talk to him. God likes it when we talk to him. He loves you so much. He loves his time with you. He wants you to pray. He wants your prayer life. He, he doesn't care that you're trying to impress people or look good for people or look at me, look what I'm doing. He's not interested in that. That's trash. That's baloney. Throw all that away. You need to humble yourself. Hide. Be by yourself with God alone. Three keys of a good prayer life. There's three. One, two, three. Very simple. Very simple. Number one, thank him. Thank him. Him. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. In everything, give thanks. Coronavirus is here. Thank you, God. Oh, well, this messed up. Thank you, God. Oh, I, I'm sick. My health has gone bad. Thank you, God. Thank you. I wake up every day. Thank you, God, for waking me up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. List all the things that he's done for you that you can be thankful for. Thank him all day long. When you're, when you're driving, thank him. Be on your God phone. Talk to him. You don't have to, to do it out loud and tell everybody else about it. Just you and God. Commune. Just the two of you. You don't have to know everything uh, or be a scholar of the Bible. Just tell him what's on your mind. You can talk to him about anything. You can be any level of education, any color skin. Anybody can say thank you to God. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for church. Thank you for my family. Thank you. Name the things that you're thankful for. Just you get on that video phone, you talk and you talk and you share all your feelings. And then you want to talk to God and you're all holy. No, by faith, talk to him. He's there and tell him thank you. That's number one. Thank him. Thank you, thank you, thank you. From A to Z, name all the things that you're thankful for. It's that simple. But be alone. Be by yourself. You don't need a crowd. You know, Jesus gave his disciples a model prayer of how to pray. And we can look at him and we can copy his example. Be humble. Pray for others. You know, uh, Jesus explained to disciples the truth. But number one, be thankful. Thankful. He taught his disciples how to be thankful. But do it by yourself by, when you're at home. Your wife, your children are watching you. Be thankful. You don't have to have people watching you. Be yourself, be alone, be with God. Well, I have to go to church and, and, and I have to act like everybody uh, can see me and I gotta check off my check mark for the week. No, you have your, your prayer love, have your time with God by yourself, just the two of you communing. You have problems that come, God, what do I do? Thank you for this problem. Now tell me what to do about it. When you're old and you're in the bed someday and your last words should be, thank you for my doctor. And then you pass. Your last, all the way to your death, your last words should be thank, thank you. <coughs> Number two, praise him. Sometimes that's hard, I know. It's easy for us to say thank you, thank you. But praise him, praise him for what? Praise you, Lord. You're all powerful God. Thank you for church where I can go. We have freedom to be here. Thank you for, for my friends. I praise you. I praise you. Psalm chapter 9, verse 1. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. Wow. You're almighty God and I praise you. You won the victory. I praise you. The coronavirus is here and things are closed and it's caused family. You've shaken things up and now you have our full attention. I praise you. Talk to God. Thank him and praise him. Oh Lord, you are the Lord of Lords and I praise you. Wow, you are the champ. You're the best. I praise you, Lord. Give him a whole list of things, of accolades and praise and worship to him. You know, when, when God hears the praise of men, he's like, wow, you're praising me. And you can have that sweet one-on-one -on -one time as he listens. And he, and he says, hey, angels, look at this. Pr go, go give him a blessing for me. Devil, look at this. He's praising me, and the devil's getting angry. Oh, be quiet. He's praising me. Look, he's giving me joy. Thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. And he fills us with such joy as we walk through the daily boo, life. And, boo, you know, boo. Some people who don't know the Lord, they may just scare them away, but praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Some people, their faith, they, they, oh, I praise the Lord. I want people to look at me. Oh, look at me. No. Have real, genuine thanks and real, genuine praise for the Lord. And he will give you those blessings. Let God be in control of you. You don't have to work so hard and be so holy. And No. Ask God, please help me. I praise you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And then I have one last third key to a good prayer life. Ask. Ask him. What, is, what does that mean? Ask. Ask. Not, not you know, just, is, ever, is anybody looking at me? Is anybody watching me? No. The, you know, the children, you know, they come to the altar sometimes at the church, and, and they're up there praying. You see them looking around to see how many people notice them. Don't, don't worry about all that. Ask him. Thank him. Praise him. Ask him, Lord, please bless my family. Ask. Please forgive my sins. I've made mistakes. I've had a bad attitude. Ask. Ask him. Ask him. All the things that you, you would like for him to do for you. Ask him. God says, I love you. I want to take care of you. Lord, please lead me. You know, I, I, I'm having some issues here. I've, I'm, my focus is messed up. Please, Lord, help me to refocus on you. Hey, Lord, I'm going food shopping today at the grocery store. Could you help me find some good deals? Ask him. Ask, ask, ask. Lord, give me wisdom today. Lord, please give me comfort today. Lead me today. Lord, I'm going to be talking with someone. I'm going to be counseling someone. Give me wisdom. Give me a heart to help, Lord. If maybe I should give them a blessing. Lord, Help me to give my tithe. I don't want to have a selfish attitude. I want to hold on to my money. I don't want to see, not be trusting in you with my money. I'm asking you to help me, Lord, to give my sac uh, sacrifice, my tithe. I may not have it to give, but I'm going to give it. Lord, Lord, the coronavirus is happening. I I'm worried. Lord, my children have a bad attitude. No. Lord, don't be accusatory when you're talking to God. Say, God, help me. Help me to be a better husband, a, a better a, a, a Christian, a better worker. Get off your phone, all the things that tempt you. Lord, I'm sorry for focusing so much. Can you help me to put the phone down? Can you help me to stay busy? He'll give you things to do. You know, I haven't been able to be on my phone much this week because I've been so busy. Wow, I haven't been on my phone all day. Lord, Lord, help me. Ask him, and the Lord will lead you, and he will guide you through your life. If you don't ask, you're just going to be like a bump on a log. You're just going to kind of sit there. And your life is so boring. Some of you have a boring life, and I'm so sorry. My kids tell me all the time, I'm so bored. I say, I'm sorry. Ask the Lord to help you, give you something to do. I'm very excited. My life is up and down, and I make mistakes sometimes, but I ask, and I ask the Lord to help me, and he does. Amen? I want to challenge you. Oh, I forgot our verse first. Matthew 21, verse 22. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. I want to add, you know, Lord, give me a TV. Lord, give me a new car. Come on, God. God, no, that's not asking. That's commanding. No, Lord, give me wisdom to find a new car. Lord, give me wisdom when I go to do this or that. You know, my children, they come to me and say, will you give me some money? Give me $1,000. I'm like, no, get out of here. My son said, uh, give me the key to the car. No, get out of here. That's a, it's, it's the way that you approach, the way that you ask. Are you commanding? Look, command. Humble yourself and ask. Ask. Don't command. Look at the difference of these signs. Don't command. <gasps> That's pretty arrogant of you to command. Humble yourself. <gasps> you know, Holy Spirit, he's telling me how to do this <gasps> You're the Holy Spirit. I want to ask. Come in and help me to teach this lesson. Thank you. You are the chair. I praise you. I praise you, Lord. Thank you. I know you're hungry for more of the word, but, you know, we have a time limit. 
So the three keys of a good prayer life. Number one, thank him. Thank him. Say it with me. Thank him. Number two, what is it? You're right. Praise him. And number three, ask him. Those are the three keys to a good prayer life. When you're at home in your house, remember those three keys. Thank him, praise him, ask him. Now, I, I have given you this, this lesson and I want to put that aside. Put all the stories aside. I want you to, because I've given you a few stories, I want you to put that aside and I want you to focus on these three, three things. The key to a good prayer life. Thank him, praise him, ask him. I'll see you next Sunday. Let's pray first. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for giving me Holy Spirit power to be able to teach this morning. I, I want to thank you. I want to praise you. And then I want to ask you to please bless our members and those who've been on this morning. Bless their lives. Help them to remember these three keys to a prayer life. We'll talk to you later. See you next week. Bye-bye.